Good morning to everyone and good evening. As you're filing in, we'll just take one moment to ensure everyone's here before we start. All right, again, hello and good morning to all of you from Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us for today's policy briefing, USMC Force Design 2030, New Deterrent Strategy Views from Japan. My name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa USA. We are honored to have Lieutenant General Koichi Isobe as our featured speaker with Lieutenant General Chip Gregson and Lieutenant General Larry Nicholson as commentators. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Our activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the engagement of exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Just a few housekeeping things I'd like to go over before we get started. Today's event is being recorded and is on the record. A recap and video recording will be made available on the Sasakawa USA website in the coming weeks. Regarding the Q&A session, we will have later in the program, you can submit your questions at any time uh, throughout the program as you would like. Uh, just please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we look forward to the lively engagement after our conversation. All right, I would like to pass this over to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Good morning. I am Satohiro Akimoto, President and Chairman of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I am delighted to see you all. It is my honor to introduce Lieutenant General Koichi Isobe. He had a long and distinct career in Japan's Grand Self-Defense Self Force, culminating in the position of 37th Commander of the Eastern Army from 2013 to 2015. I'm particularly delighted to have him today as our main speaker, simply because he is one of the most informed and careful thinkers of national security issues in Japan. I was in Tokyo at the end of July and early August. I came across with his article on Marine Corps force redesign in a monthly magazine called Seiron. I was impressed with the article and immediately got in touch with him. He graciously accepted my offer to present his views on this important subject matter to American friends and Japanese colleagues. So thank you very much, General Isobe. If I may add, he has been very familiar with the Marine Corps closely working with, with them during his active service duty and even earned a master's degree at USMC University in Quantico, Virginia. I'm equally delighted to have two former US Marine Corps generals, Lieutenant General Chip Gregson and Lieutenant General Larry Nicholson as speakers today. Both of them who don't need any introduction to the audience worked with the Japanese for a long time in the framework of US-Japan Security Alliance in their distinct careers and served as commanding general of a Marine expeditionary force in Japan. As their professional experience and strategic interest reach far beyond Northeast Asia to Asia Pacific in general, Central Asia, Middle East and Africa, I really looking forward to hearing their views following General Isobe's presentation. I would like to add that the General Chip Gregson kindly presented his, his view on this very subject matter with us last July. I recommend the audience to read the recap and to see the video of his presentation following today's event on our website. Lastly, I would like to mention General Nicholson has been spending lots of sleepless nights coordinating with and among Tampa, Kabul, and Washington, D.C. to help all the Afghan friends and their families who served his brigade in Afghanistan get through physical and the bureaucratic roadblocks to safety. His action is not only to help friends in the dire situation, but also to preserve the U.S. reputation among the Asian friends who has been carefully observing the situation. So thank you very much, General Nicholson. With that, let's begin 
General Isobe, floor is yours. Good morning and good evening, my fellow friends, both in the States and Japan. My name is Koichi Isobe, a retired Lieutenant General of Japan Ground Self Defense Force and a 1996 graduate of the U.S. Marine Corps Command and Staff College in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, first, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to Dr. Akimoto, the president of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, for inviting me to this policy brief webinar. I'm looking forward to having a discussion with my old friends, Jenna Gregson and Jenna Nicholson. The last time I met with both generals was at General Nicholson's residence in DC. I think it was in June 2019, two years ago. Larry was moving to Tennessee and I was leaving for Japan after finishing a two year fellowship at Harvard University. Very nice meeting you, nice seeing you today. In Tokyo, the Olympic games are over and the Paralympics have just started. In this Olympics, amazingly, the Japanese self-defense force, JSDF athletes made remarkable achievements. Three gold, one silver and one bronze medals. Now, Afghanistan issue. The government of Japan decided to send JSDF cargo planes to Afghanistan to evacuate Japanese people and if necessary, foreign nationals. A C-2 and two C-130s took off today. Now, uh, let me start the webinar. First, I would like to illustrate how I perceived General Berger's philosophy by reading the two documents, Force Design 2030 and Preparing for the Future. As a matter of fact, Jenna Gregson kindly sent me this Force Design 2030 immediately after its release. Maybe I was one of the first to have read it. And then I would like to touch upon how the US Marine Corps transformation would affect the Japan's national security efforts and the Japan-US bilateral alliance efforts. When I first read General Berger's documents, I was deeply impressed by his ironclad resolve for transformation, his leadership, and his insights. I perceived that the Marine Corps is entering a historic transformation era. I believe the US Marine Corps transformation would eventually influence Japan's defense policy in the near future, because Japan is soon entering a critical time for the development of the new national security strategy and other security policy. Then I wrote an article, which is an introductory paper of the US Marine Corps transformation for the Japanese people, especially intended for academia and policymakers. The Sankei newspapers, monthly magazine, Ceylon, actually this is the, the magazine. And uh, my article is the, this one. I started the article with the following sentences. I quote, the cross trade situation is increasingly becoming a hot, potential hotspot. On July 1st, in President Xi Jinping's speech at the Chinese Communist Party, CCP's centennial, centennial anniversary, he clearly said, resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete reunification is a historic mission and an unshakable commitment for the CCP. Even such a tumultuous situation as the Taiwan Strait, it seems that the General David H. Berger, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and his best and brightest are quietly devising their future concept. An essence of the concept appeared on the surface as two documents signed by Commandant Berger, Force Design 2030, released in March 2020, and Preparing for the Future, released in May 2021. Let's take a look at how the Marine Corps would transform in the future, based upon the Commandant's papers, and what it would mean for the national security of Japan." Unquote. 
As most of the audience here may already be familiar with the concept of the marine cause transformation, I am not going to touch upon details of the documents. Both distinguished marine generals have far better wisdom about these than me. I would rather point out from the Japanese perspective what I have learned from his philosophy. These are basically three. One, growing threat of precision strike capabilities. Second, the future role of the Marine Corps, focusing on deterrence. Third, Marine Corps back to basics, the nation's naval expeditionary force in readiness. So first, growing threat of precision strike capability. The coherent threat recognition underlying embargo's documents is the globally and rapidly proliferating precision strike regime. In the papers, General Barger has not clarified who they are, but I interpret these are People Liberation Army, PLAs, IRBM, and MRBM capabilities such as DF-21, DF-24. The proliferation of precision strike weapon systems has made fixed facilities and large units on ground and large vessels at sea even more vulnerable. Therefore, within the effective range of enemy weapon system, there is a growing risk to naval task forces and large ground forces. For the US, these missiles threaten US bases in Okinawa and Guam and also may hinder the freedom of navigation and action of the US forces. For Japan, these missiles are a real threat to the Japanese territory. The Japanese government has not clearly identified the PLA's missile capability as a threat due to political interpretations or considerations. But from a military perspective, it is clear these missile capabilities are a potential threat for Japan. Second, the future role of the Marine Corps focusing on deterrence. In my understanding, Commandant Berger focuses on contributing to deterrence as Marine's future role. Commandant says, I quote, the obvious facts of geography, the intersection of threat and US interests means that our inter interaction with several of our most formidable challenges will largely occur within the maritime domain, unquote. In Force Design 2030, he made clear his belief that traditional organizational arrangements, training, and equipment must be transformed to meet the new goals, and insisted that the Force Design that the Marine Corps had previously considered to be immutable should be transformed into a smaller, more dispersed, and more survivable force. Traditional force design is based on forcible amphibious operations. He argues that this needs to be fundamentally reviewed. In a sense, this is an innovative claim that would discontinue the past belief. Speaking of the Marine Corps, many people, both in the States and Japan, recall the eye-opening photograph of Marines flying the Stars and Stripes on Mount Suribachi, Iwo Jima. The commandant himself insisted that the Marines should not rely solely on the ability to carry out assault landing operations, such as the Battle of Iwo Jima. He argues, that he does not believe that the joint assault landing operation is off the mark or an anachronism. But he argues that a different approach is required in an anti-access and area denial, A280 environment. He then presented the direction of the future force design and called for further discussions in the future. In particular, I focused on the claim that I quote, we are not designing an across the Roma force and across the range of military operations force, but rather a force intended to prevent major conflict and deter the escalation of conflict 
within the Roma, unquote. This idea is characterized by its focus on military force design that focuses on deterrence. And I have read the significance of the Marine Corps' transformation in that regard. Third, Marine Corps, back to basics, the nation's naval expeditionary force in readiness. I have a clear impression that the Marine Corps is going back to basics and to its origins. For the last two decades, the Marine have been employed in deserts or inland in the Middle East. Now the battlefield and the adversary are completely different. The Marine Corps will likely be spending much less time in the desert or inland environments. I believe that Commandant Bagger has identified the Marine Corps raison d'etre or core value as the nation's naval expeditionary force in readiness. United States Code Title 10, Section 5063 says, I quote, the Marine Corps shall be organized, trained, and equipped to provide fleet marine forces of combined arms together with supporting air components for service with the fleet in the seizure or defense of advanced naval bases and for the conduct of such land operations as may be essential to the prosecution of a naval campaign." Unquote. Based on these observations of the Marine Corps transmission, my logical supposition is as follows. The threat perception of the Marine Corps is almost identical to the one of the JSDF, I think. But there is a difference in terms of difference in terms of strategic objective. The Marine Corps objective is to enable naval and joint forces to have a freedom of navigation and operations in the vicinity of the first island chain. As for Japan, the first island chain itself is our own territory. For Japan, it would be the territorial defense operations. On these islands, many Japanese people inhabit. The JSDF's strategic objective is to preserve sovereignty, to defend these islands, and to protect the people. So let me explain two issues. One is Japan's unilateral national security effort, and the other is Japan-US bilateral alliance effort. Implications of the US Marine Corps transformation to the Japan security policy. The Marine Corps and the US military are trying to strengthen their stance in the great power competition with China. The approach emphasis, emphasizes deterrence in order to make the cost of PRC, People's Republic of China, aggression so high that it forces them to give up their attempts to invade. If China and the US fall into a full-scale military conflict, both sides will surely suffer unbearable damage, Japan also. And the conflict would eventually trigger a world war. Therefore, I think the US military is trying to establish a powerful and effective deterrent posture, which enables PRC leaders to abandon their ambitions at an earlier stage. Of course, the US military is also preparing for full-fledged military conflict, assuming the worst case scenario. The JSDF, I think, has been focusing on physical defense of these islands by stationing ground self-defense force troops and establishing the Amphibious Rapid Deployment Brigade, ARDB. These efforts have, of course, strengthened the deterrent posture of the southwestern islands. In addition to these efforts, considering the PLA's rapidly growing precision strike capabilities, Japan should develop its capability to deter and respond to these missile threats. PLA's missile ranges cover not only the southwestern islands, but also mainland Japan. Japan should develop a deterrence strategy against the adversary's potential missile threat. In order to do that, 
the JG, JSDF needs a more comprehensive deterrence policy. I would say that Japan's defense policy so far has rather focused on responding to respective conflict scenario, such as ballistic missile launch, remote islands invasion, and in other words, with patchwork responses rather than a comprehensive approach. In order to effectively respond to various threat scenarios, Japan needs to establish a comprehensive deterrence strategy ranging from a gray zone scenario, a remote island scenario, an armed conflict scenario, to nuclear threatening. To make it relevant and formidable, Japan should build a defense strategy that places more weight on deterrence. Next, bilateral efforts. How the Japan and the US military should consult and cooperate in a very challenging era and region. First, align their respective RMCs, roles, missions, and capabilities. In the arguments of General Bagger, I have noticed that close coordination between Japan and the US is necessary and furthermore critical for deterrence. He, re he reiterates the importance of combined efforts with allies and partner forces, not to mention jointness among the US military. Of course, when Marine standing force would operate along the first island chain, there is no doubt that JSDF units will also be deployed to the southwestern islands. A standing force is a unit designed to generate technically disruptive tactical stand-in engagements that confront aggressor naval forces with an array of low signature and affordable platforms and payloads. In some cases, the JSDF may deal with the situation alone, and there will be a situation in which Japan and the US will deal with it together. It is imperative to discuss in advance what role the US military and the JSDF will assume in the event of a great zone situation or armed conflict. If the situation deteriorating Standing force, Marines, standing force may conduct expeditionally advanced base operations in and around the fast island chain. This chain extends from Japan's mainland to the southwestern islands, including Okinawa, then to Taiwan to the Philippines. It means that in contingencies, the Marines standing force and the JSDF's ARDB and other units are presumably operating side by side. Commandant Bagger reiterates the importance of C5 ISRT, command, control, communication, computer, cyber, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and targeting. And then he says, I quote, with the right investments and doctrine for our own joint and combined C5 ISRT, this capability broadens to encompass the possibility of highly resilient kill webs able to link available sensors and shooters even in the face of adversary disruption of the information domain." Unquote. Both forces eventually need to align their respective roles, missions, and capabilities. Based on the current Japan-US defense cooperation guidelines, uh, which were developed in 2015, both forces can deepen the RMC discussions. Or another option is to revise the defense guidelines to cope with the emerging security challenges in East Asia. So second, Bilateral command and control relationship. In conjunction with the RMC discussions, it is also necessary to begin serious discussions on the formulation of command and control relationship of both forces. For the Japanese side, I believe that the JSDF needs standing joint headquarters, which could become an operational counterpart of the indo pacom headquarters. I was director of J5 Japan Joint Staff when the Great Eastern Japan 
earthquake occurred in March 2011. Since my experi experience of Operation Tomodachi, my strong belief has been the establishment of a standing joint headquarters. For the US side, I think it is appropriate for the indo pacom headquarters to reconsider a more desirable command and control structure in East Asia, especially Northeast Asia. Since the Korean War of 1950s, the US forces command and control structure of East Asia has remained intact. Both forces have similar command and control issues. Furthermore, both forces have bilateral issues with regard to their command and control relationship. From a professional military perspective, a single commander is best suited for conducting military operations among multiple militaries. However, both governments agree to conduct bilateral operations under their respective chains of command. This is why we refer to Japan-US operations as bilateral and not combined. In order to conduct well-coordinated and timely bilateral operations, both forces need to conduct more detailed planning. For example, to what degree do both commanders delegate authority to the coordination center? And how is the ISR information or data between the two forces shared. These efforts are critically important for mission accomplishment, as our adversary would conduct joint operations under a single commander. Of course, they may have a dif different deficiency in command structure due to their use of dual command channels, both Chinese Communist Party and military command. When conducting U.S. Marine Corps EABO, Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, and JSDF's Territorial Defense Operations, targeting is surely one of the most challenging issues for both forces. The targeting must be synchronized. Concrete preparation for such joint and bilateral operations are extremely vital for success and effective for deterrence against adversaries. As a conclusion for unilateral efforts, Japan should develop its comprehensive deterrence strategy and should coordinate it with the US counterparts. For both forces, they need to align their respective roles, missions, and capabilities, and they need to develop a desirable command and control and targeting structure. Finally, I will conclude by introducing General Bargard's statement at the US House Appro Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense on April 29th. A friend of mine in the Marine Corps uh, told me this story. I quote, we can learn from other nations as much as we can teach. For example, the Japanese Amphibious Rapid Deployment Brigade may have used the US Marine Corps as an example in its development. But we have much to learn from them based on how quickly they designed, assembled, tested, and operationalized the brigade. Our commitment to working with allies and partners creates a mutually beneficial relationship for our military organizations, while simultaneously signaling our resolve to competitors. Initiatives like the Pacific Deterrence and the European Deterrence are so important in supporting our posture." Unquote. Though I am a retired officer, but uh, on this occasion, on behalf of the entire Japan Ground Service Defense Force, I would like to express our deepest appreciation with every fiber of our being to the US Marine Corps for having nurtured the JSDF's amphibious rapid Deployment Brigade. Without the US Marine Corps' full fledged support and dedication, the ALDB could not have existed today. A deepened bond among the US Marine Corps, as well as the US military and the Japan Self Defense Forces, will make steadfast deterrence in the Indo Pacific region. 121 years ago, in summer 1900, the US Marine Corps and the Japanese Imperial Army were fighting together against 
the Boxer Rebellion to protect their diplomatic compounds in Beijing. U.S. Marine Captain John Twig Myers was leading the American Legation Guard. Lieutenant Colonel Goro Shiba was also leading. Colonel Shiba later made a speech in Tokyo. He told the story how he worked closely with Captain Myers. And thanks to the captain's heroic actions, the American post was strengthened and allowed the foreign missions to survive in the compound for 55 days. In those days, the adversary was a rebellion during the decline of China's Qin Dynasty. Nowadays, we are facing a rising communist China and a formidable modern military, the PLA, People's Liberation Army. We shall deter the CCP's ambitious intention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes uh, my speech. Well, thank you very much, General Isobe for your uh, clear, logical, and thoughtful uh, presentation. You have contributed much already to the um, dialogue and set the stage for subsequent uh, uh, discussion we're going to have today. Uh, first discussion uh, we have is uh, Lieutenant General Chip Gregson. Chip, uh, floor is yours. Oh, good morning and good evening. And thank you to Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA for sponsoring this session. And thanks to General Isobe for his perceptive and detailed explanation of the US Marine Corps Force Design 2030 from the Japanese perspective. His skillful analysis provides a valuable foundation for our efforts to increase the deterrent strength of our alliance and to increase our combat power through integration of the maneuver and fires of all the components of our collective forces. The geography of East Asia is not destiny, but it does profoundly shape it. It is quite obviously a maritime theater. There is a maritime chart in virtually every Japanese government office I have had the opportunity to visit. It's not the distorted Mercator projection so often seen. It is a projection of the China coast and the seas and the islands to the southeast of Beijing. The perspective is one of a geosynchronous satellite above Beijing looking 135 degrees to the southeast. Sakhalin Island and Japan are to the left. Japan, the Korean Peninsula, the Korean State in the Yellow Strait and the Yellow Sea are in the middle. The East China Sea, the islands of the Nansei Shoto, Taiwan and the Philippines carry your view to the right. Farther out, the second island chain from Iwo To to the Northern Mariana Islands, then Guam, and from Guam back to the Southern Philippines completes the picture. The Japanese are well aware that all of these are connected. When China looks at this, it resembles a great wall in reverse with democratic maritime nations, including the US, along the island chain. China views our presence here as proof of malign intent as a potential threat to their seaborne commerce and a break on their destiny. China's economic, political, and cultural centers are in the eastern coastal regions. Seaborne commerce depends on access to the Korea Strait, the Miyako Strait, the Bashi Channel, and to the south, the Malacca, Lombok and Sunda Straits. For most of the last 70 years in this area, we were able to exploit unchallenged control of the seas within and throughout the first island chain. We were free from serious challenge. We concentrated on the other maritime function, that of projecting power ashore from a secure sea base. During the war in Korea from 1950 to 1953, the Navy became the foundation of our successes and the salvation of our disasters as combat came down the peninsula, went back up, came down again, and then back up again. The Seventh Fleet kept units joined in the ground combat in North Korea. The, the Seventh Fleet kept units between the Chinese mainland and Taiwan. Mao's China joined in the ground combat in North Korea but was unable to project force to seaward. Interestingly, there was an evacuation of Marines of the 1st Marine Division 
Korean soldiers and North Korean civilians from Hung Nam on the east coast of North Korea when China entered the war. Japanese maritime units contributed to that evacuation force. In Vietnam, our fleet maintained continuous presence off the coast of North and South Vietnam, providing secure logistics support as well as fire support. Mao could send pilots and airplanes to North Vietnam and occasionally soldiers as observers, but the seas were still ours. Operational concepts and weapon system developed over these years, assuming assured and secure control of the seas. The effects of that assumption are still with us, but times have changed. Deng Xiaoping set China on the road to riches. Now China's powerful command-directed economy and industrial base provide a massive amount of military material from satellites to airplanes, ships, submarines, and missiles of all ranges. They have the advantage of a vast geographic sanctuary for long range weapons that can be used in a fight for sea and air superiority. Generally, Sobe's points about the precision strike regime and the reconnaissance counter reconnaissance fight are exactly right. We're outnumbered and outranged. What can be found can be targeted and what can be targeted can be hit if it can't evade, hide or defeat the attack. New operational concepts are needed. Forces on land must not, must not remain passive in a fight for sea control. This brings us back to the Marine Corps developing Force Design 2030, the Japanese Amphibious Rapid Deployment Brigade, and the many experiments and war games underway to refine tactics and techniques. This is indeed a maritime theater, and is, it is amenable to new forms of amphibious operations. Instead of gathering massive forces at sea for a powerful assault of a defended area, we are developing operational concepts to take advantage of today's long range precision guided weapons to defend the first island chain archipelago. The territory, the interest and the lives of our allies and friends along this littoral are what is important to us. We must disperse and remain mobile to survive. We must also be lethal to enemy forces at sea and in the air. Long range maneuverable precision weapons offer opportunities. Amphibious forces deployed in small units, perhaps as small as platoons and squads, armed with anti-ship and anti-air missiles can maneuver on and among the many available islands. Japan alone has 600, 6,000 Sorry, Japan alone has 6,852 such islands. Their maneuver and fires can and must be integrated with those of our air and surface forces. So we are all in the same battle at the same time with a superior operational tempo. Thoroughly networked forces can fire weapons well beyond visual range. The system will choose the firing agency and location best place to engage. The old axiom of shoot, move, and communicate will gain new credibility. Our bases will not be closed. Let me repeat that again. Our bases will not be closed. They make a profound political statement long before they make a military statement. They are also a cost-effective way for both maintenance and training. We do need to harden these bases and provide some defense for them perhaps some, in, some version of, Israeli, of the Israeli Iron Dome system would be helpful. But we must be able to quickly deploy from the bases and fight from other places, ideally scattered along the littoral, protecting our friends and allies and controlling the straits that China needs to sortie their fleet and for commerce. We must fight as widely distributed, operationally resilient, agile, mobile, and to our enemies, dangerous forces. Thank you, and I uh, will await questions. Thank you very much, General Gregson. Uh, we go to uh, uh, General Nicholson. Hey, good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, General Zasobi. Great to see you again, sir, and General Gregson, for your insightful and always interesting comments. 
Uh, and again, thanks to uh, Dr. Satohiro and the Saskagawa team for, uh, again, hosting these, these wonderful events. Really uh, appreciate being part of it. Hey, so my comments today are going to be short, uh, I think, to the point uh, so we can get to the Q&A, uh, which is always the most interesting portion of any presentation. But I do want to underscore what has been said by the previous speakers about the significant transformation uh, that is uh, occurring uh, in our Marine Corps in pursuit of multi-domain operations as, as part of EABO, or Ex uh, Expeditionary Advanced Base Ops. You know, I served as a Marine for almost 40 years, and the changes undertaken by Commandant Berger as part of Force Design 2030 are the most significant and profound changes made to our Marine Corps in the last half century. We are building a, a Marine Corps that is lighter, faster, smarter, uh, and yet more lethal and able to attack the enemy in every domain. And while you may not see any Marines in space anytime soon uh, fighting in space, I, I can tell you we're going to be highly uh, engaged and connected to uh, space and cyber assets uh, that support the warfighter. What was interesting to me is uh, participating in some recent exercises is that the integration of space and cyber is occurring at every level. You want to move airplanes? Well, you better get those satellites ready. You, you want to, you want to, uh, uh, go after targets, well, you better make sure your space and cyber effects are there. Today's commanders are utilizing and training with our cyber and space forces to achieve the effects on the battlefield in a matter that even I, as the CG of 3MEF in 2018, would not recognize. This understanding and incorporation of these emerging capabilities to protect resources, move assets, provide logistics, and communicate in a, uh, in a highly degraded calm environment are no longer considered exquisite capabilities. They are essential capabilities that are being incorporated into every aspect of training and war gaming today. A big challenge facing our core uh, that, that is still uh, really unsolved uh, is the movement inside uh, the weapons engagement zone. In an environment where tactical mobility provides strategic advantage, I know Commandant Berger and his team are working tirelessly with industry and our own experimental design teams to accomplish this most challenging task. Uh, and of course, uh, that will be occurring uh, within the uh, enemy threat ring or inside the weapons engagement zone. And I know uh, a lot of work and, and effort by our commandant is, is focused on achieving uh, those platforms that will be used uh, in that environment. I wanna to shift to one of my favorite topics and that's training and, and exercising. Um, training with allies and partners has always been an important demonstration of, of friendship, commitment, and strong bonds between our nations. You know, I grew up in the Marine Corps where large-scale training exercises, either bilateral or multinational, especially in the Pacific, were frankly very gentlemanly and pedestrian. The troops were never overly tasked, and they looked forward really to great liberty at the end of the uh, mission. Even as I grew older and more senior in the ranks, the focus was on cooperation and deconfliction in time and space, vice detailed collaboration and interoperability. I think that older mindset uh, has given way to the reality that we face now, uh, and, and that is a threat that we must thoroughly prepare for. Today, we face the necessity of working with multiple allies in the hard work of detailed contingency planning and the ability to share real-time common operating picture. We need an expansion of five eyes or some other process uh, so we can share what we know, what we see, and what we can target. We no longer have the luxury of exercises where every tactical action is a success and every participant a victor. It's time to train like we will fight, and that begins with close cooperation and grinding work. What do we need to be doing? We need to get our best and brightest planners from the U.S. and Japan. They should be meeting in Tokyo, Okinawa, Hawaii, Washington, even Sydney with our Australian colleagues to hammer out realistic, detailed, and comprehensive operational plans that not only build personal relations between our planners and leaders, but create familiar, familiarity with each other's strengths, and vulnerabilities by uncovering those gaps and seams that each of us have, but rarely discuss. Those plans should be tested over and over again during grueling tabletop exercises against a robust thinking enemy and red cell designed to exploit every weakness and capitalize on every strength until we have achieved a fluency of the geography, the enemy's capabilities, the enemy's weapons, his tendencies, centers of gravities, critical vulnerabilities, and of course, most probable and dangerous courses of action. And then do it all over again in a different scenario with an even more robust enemy. 
planning in particular, military planning is an art form. And the more planners work together as a team, the more prepared they and we will be if we ever have to fight together. The old notion of allies being separated by time, space, mission, working in separate areas of operation will not work in a future fight. Familiarity with each other are no longer nice to have. They are necessary to succeed. I'll close by beating an old drum for me, and that's the interoperability that begins with joint basing in Japan. Uh, for too long now, uh, the geographical separation of US and Japanese forces in Okinawa has been out of step with the mainland and, and frankly not useful uh, to the topics that, uh, that I just mentioned. I'll, I'll share with you in, in 2015, I became the commanding general of 3MF in my first visit to uh, Iwakuni, Japan. I, I noticed Japanese uh, airplanes on, on our US airfield. I further went to Yokosuka, Yokota, Atsugi, every base I went to on the mainland, there were Japanese sailors, soldiers, and, and airmen working side by side with their US counterparts. As I looked around Okinawa, I noticed that uh, we were different. Uh, we, we were lost in, in, in time. Uh, many of our bases, uh, you know, frankly, looked like, uh, you know, occupational, uh, you know, remnants uh, from, from the end of the war. There, there was no interoperability and, and very, very hard to work with, the, uh, with the, either the uh, Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force or, or the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Coco Jetai, the, the Jazz Dad. You know, as an example, uh, today at uh, Kinin Air Force Base, uh, you know, we have a very robust uh, presence. Our, our Japanese Air Force Coco Jetai friends are, are at Kinin Airport. Um, our, our Navy P-8s uh, are, are at Kadena, the, the Japanese uh, 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 P-1s and, and, and their aircraft are uh, again at, uh, at, at the uh, airport uh, in, in Okinawa, the civilian airport. Um, I think we've been pushing and, and I know that uh, many of my Japanese counterparts were very supportive of the ARDB, providing one of their regiments in Okinawa, uh, providing them co-located with the 31st MU. Uh, there at, at Camp Schwab, and I, I think it's the ideal place. So I, I hope that uh, th this concept continues to gain traction, uh, but I think it is critically important. Uh, our success in the future will be dictated by our familiarity with each other, uh, our, our personal relations, our, our cooperation, our ability to exercise and, and train together. So I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, thank you uh, again for the uh, great opportunity to participate today. And I look forward to uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, General Nicholson, for your crisp and uh, quick to the point uh, uh, comments. I really appreciate it. Uh, General Isobe, do you have any uh, uh, quick response to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, generals? Uh, thank you, both generals. Uh, very insightful observations and uh, comments. And uh, I, I just uh, received a uh, question uh, from uh, Mochizuki Sensei. Mike Mochizuki is at the George Washington University. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Mochizuki Sensei for uh, giving me a question. And uh, Sensei's question is uh, what is the distinction of the territorial defense? So I think uh, at the very early stage, so territorial defense, we need to consider the residents, civilian residents on the islands. So at an earlier stage, we need civil protection uh, for the civilians and evacuate from the island. So this mission is very important, especially in Okinawa prefecture. So I emphasize this. And also after the operation is over, then we need move to the phase four. Phase four is the restoration of the uh, territory. So for the self-defense force, we need to think very early stage evacuation of the uh, civilian people. And the, the last stage, we need to restore uh, the territory. So during the operation, I think uh, the US forces and Japanese forces uh, uh, conduct operations side by side. So th this is my answer. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, we have uh, uh, over 150 people uh, uh, registered for this event. It's a very popular event. 
and several people actually sent in uh, uh, some questions prior to the event. I just wanted to uh, uh, introduce one question, which was asked by uh, uh, Colonel uh, Thomas uh, uh, Woods. Uh, he uh, recently published an article, a US, Na uh, US Naval Institute proceeding article with, uh, uh, together with uh, uh, Brigadier General Bill Bowers. His question is, given the critically important role that the US military base, bases serve in Japan, how should these installations be modernized to better support, number one, adversely deterrence, deterrence, and number two, allied competition below the threshold of traditional armed conflict? This is a question to uh, General Isobe, obviously, but uh, uh, General Nicholson, General Gregson, uh, uh, please uh, 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 chime in. Well, I think the uh, base is a uh, very important and uh, considering the threat of the missile attacks, uh, we need to strengthen or fortify the military installations uh, in Okinawa or mainland Japan also. So we have to be resilient uh, against the missile threat. Chip. Uh, General Bowers and uh, Colonel Woods introduced a very interesting concept in their article and proceedings, tactical hardening, operational hardening, and political hardening. Uh, they, I fully support General, General Nicholson's drive for integration of our bases, the, the combination of our bases uh, throughout, uh, throughout Okinawa, just like they are on the mainland. Uh, that's a lot that uh, provides a high degree of political hardening in that it makes the uh, uh, the, the the bonds the the connections within the alliance visible and it also enhances our proficiency among other things. Uh, secondly, we've got to harden the bases. Uh, it uh, your uh, it's uh, at a, at a reasonable level. That's also recommended in their article. And we need uh, some form of cost-effective missile defense, among other things. But as I said, we also need to be able to deploy from uh, the base. The, the question about the allied competition below the level of kinetic warfare is very interesting. Chinese political warfare is ever-present, ever-growing, and ever more in need of uh, a counter effort uh, to ensure that we vaccinate ourselves as much as possible against those political warfare efforts. And I, I think that uh, uh, going to the combined base construct and taking uh, a lot of the recommendations that General Isobe made, looking at our command relationships from PACOM on down and building a way to have truly combined collective operations in the US-Japan alliance while maintaining Japan's sovereignty over Japan's forces, US sovereignty over US forces. Uh, we need to work on this as uh, uh, a way to enhance our deterrence, to vaccinate ourselves against political warfare, to vaccinate ourselves against uh, gray zone uh, tactics and to work uh, uh, together as a truly combined collective force with a superior operational tempo. Thank you. Larry, do you have any comment? You know, sir, I don't think I can uh, summarize it much better than, uh, than the previous two speakers, but uh, certainly if you look at uh, the collaboration and, and close cooperation of our forces, US and Japanese forces uh, in Okinawa, that, that gives you a, a tremendous uh, a, a tremendous advantage if you're operating in the Southwest Islands, uh, because we're, we're both there already. And, and, and frankly, I think we can do a lot better. And, and I think it's very frustrating for the US side uh, not to be able to train uh, more deeply and uh, more significantly uh, with, with our allies. As, as far as the basis go, I, I, again, I too read the, uh, the great article. Uh, and, and I think John Gregson's comment about they, they send a political statement. I, I think it's an important uh, demonstration of, of, of unity, uh, but it doesn't mean we're gonna fight from those bases. And, uh, but, but whether it's an Iron Dome concept, certainly uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, to prepare those bases uh, should, uh, uh, should conflict begin. 
So that, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is by Admiral Bob Natter. The very solid approach by JGSDF and US Marine Corps 3MF is widely embraced as an appropriate strategy and a mission for both organizations. Does JMSDF and the Pacific Fleet 7th Fleet also actively support and plan for the close coordination and mutual support required for the successful execution of the first island change and the homeland defense requirement? Well, uh... I'm not so familiar with the JMSDF and the Pacific Fleet uh, relationship. But uh, when I uh, observe the exercises like on uh, amphibious type operations, uh, JGSDF, uh, ALDB, and the uh, JMSDF's uh, flotilla uh, uh, forces are closely conducting the exercise very good. So I think uh, I I'm, I'm don't know in detail about the Navy to Navy relationship, but I think uh, I trust uh, they are doing very well. Chip, Larry, any comments? Chip, please. Um, <clears throat> I will only add that viewed as an outsider, uh, the US Navy, Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, alignment and interoperability is, I think, uh, best of all the service components uh, between the US and Japan. We have interoperability, we have technical issues uh, interoper in interoperability on the ground side between the uh, US Army, US Marine Corps and the Ground Self-Defense Force and uh, uh, the uh, Air Forces, the JAZZ staff and the US Air Force has some challenges on interoperability and those challenges are not helped by the recent increase in the cost of modernizing some of Japan's F-15 fleet uh, to the point where I understand Japan is uh, backing away from completing the modernization uh, of the F-15s. This is exactly the wrong way to go. We need to... Uh, figure out how to get better at controlling the cost and uh, make a solid run at uh, eliminating the technical issues to interoperability and integration and then following generally Sobe's recommendations and General Nicholson's recommendations to increase the, uh, uh, the interoperability, the integration in our tactics, techniques, procedures, doctrines, uh, uh, all those things. Thank you. Larry, do you have any comment? Uh, just very quickly, yeah. uh, I think every day we're not working and training together is an opportunity lost. It, that, that we were squandering some time, frankly. At, at this point, we should be flying together, sailing together, training together. And, and I think the, the opportunities that we're missing today, uh, if we don't capitalize on them soon, I, I think we'll, uh, we will regret the time we spent uh, not working together, not planning together, and. And I really think, uh, you know, getting our best and brightest young planners from Japan and, and the United States and Australia together uh, and keep locking these guys in rooms and, and make them do scenario after scenario uh, and, and, until we have reached that level of, uh, of understanding. Uh, I, I think these are, these are times we won't get back. So that's my comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have already reached 10 o'clock, but uh, if I may, I'd like to ask uh, uh, one more question from the uh, audience, which is from a different uh, uh, angle than uh, uh, we've been uh, discussing. Uh, the question is about the political obstacles uh, that the Force Design 2030 might face. And uh, uh, this is a question for uh, General Gregson and General Nicholson, but at the same time, I'd like to uh, uh, ask General Isobe to answer, if possible, uh, what are the political obstacles that uh, uh, your uh, Japan's response to uh, uh, Force Design 2030 uh, may face in Japan in Japanese politics? And the Japanese politics is a, a, a very difficult situation at this particular time, to say the least. So, uh, um, um, uh, Chip, two words: continuing resolution. We're not going to have a defense budget on time. Uh, It'll be at least three months late. You can't uh, fund any new starts when you're under a continuing resolution in our budget system. And uh, 
every continuing resolution that uh, we have to endure in our government is a gift to our adversaries. Thank you. General Nicholson. Yeah, I, I think uh, if you look at uh, some of the criticism General Berger has received, it, it, is, it is probably uh, a, a feeling of what about those legacy roles that the Marine Corps has? Uh, the Marine Corps has always been the nation's quick response force. Uh, if we are so totally invested in uh, expeditionary advanced base operations uh, in the Pacific, what, what about the rest of the world? And, and I think this, this past couple of weeks showed that we were still able to to move, uh, you know, several thousand Marines into uh, Kabul airport, uh, you know, pretty seamlessly, pretty, pretty quickly. At the same time, we have, uh, you know, several hundred Marines that, uh, that went to Haiti uh, uh, on ship. So I, I, I think there is some political sensitivity. Is, is the Marine Corps uh, changing its, its roles and missions that have been assigned by, uh, you know, by, by our government? And, and I think the answer is no, uh, but, but certainly, um, as General Berger looks to, to prepare uh, for, uh, for what he thinks is the existential threat to our nation, I, I think he's, he's right on target. He's doing those right things without giving up those roles and responsibilities we have uh, to, our, to our nation. Thank you very much. Uh, General Isobe. Yes, um, a few weeks ago, I uh, listened to the General Snyder's uh, speech at the Foreign Press Center in Japan, Tokyo. And uh, there's, there was an, a question about uh, uh, from the uh, media uh, that the, the Marine Corps is uh, shifting to the uh, very small sized dispersed and the mobile survivable forces. Then why does the Marine Corps need the US uh, military installations in Okinawa. So this kind of question uh, will, will rise, would rise in the Japanese uh, politics also. So uh, I think we need to uh, clarify or we need to explain why the US uh, uh, military bases are necessary in Okinawa. So we need to continue to uh, make effort this kind of an uh, uh, explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 in order to uh, do uh, what uh, General Isobe just uh, just said, uh, uh, stability in political leadership in Japan is very important, and the situation today is uh, 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 worrisome, uh, to say the least. Um, we try not to keep people online more than an hour, and uh, I hope that we can get back to a uh, uh, you know in person meeting or hybrid meeting uh, sometime soon. But uh, 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 I just wanted to say that uh, uh, you know there are seven more questions to go, and uh, uh, it's just impossible to do at this particular time. But uh, uh, you know um, we had an uh, um, event on this very subject matter with uh, uh, General Gregson, General Nicholson, uh, uh, General Bancho last summer, and I promised that, that we continue to uh, uh, tackle this important issue with uh, a leading thinker and the leading experts uh, at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. And I just wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, General Isobe uh, uh, for uh, joining us late at night in Tokyo. And uh, uh, I really appreciated your thoughtful uh, comment to uh, set the framework for our discussion. And uh, uh, my uh, 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 deepest thanks uh, also go to uh, uh, General Gregson and General Nicholson. And again, uh, General Nicholson, uh, thank you very much for your uh, hard work uh, getting uh, uh, your friends, our friends out of uh, Afghanistan. And I really appreciate it, uh, uh, what you have been doing. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I promise that I will continue uh, this important uh, discussion on the, on the same subject matter. Thank you very much and uh, uh, have a good evening and have a good day.